Welcome again to part three, our last part of the series that we have been looking at. We've been studying the three angels' messages, particularly the issue of worship. In our first part, we found out the identity of who we are to worship, give glory to, and to fear. That is the true and only God, the Father, the Lord of heaven and earth, the living God. And we also found out the way to the Father, that it's only through Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, and that's his qualification for being the only one through whom we can come to the Father. In part two of our study, we also looked at how God and his Son can be with us. Because God can operate on the physical, visible level. We saw he has a form and shape. But God also can operate on the spiritual, invisible level. The Bible calls that the Holy Spirit. In our last part, we will be dealing with the issue of the mark of the beast. What is the mark of the beast? And how does that relate to the issue of worship? What is the contest of worship that is happening that the devil is trying to deceive the whole world into captivating and capturing their worship? In our last part, we also saw the deception that Satan has been building all the way from Babylon and that has infiltrated the world's churches and our books and publications and even the Bible. And that concept finds its place in many, many places. We saw that it's a direct contradiction and a deformation of the truth that the Bible reveals about God. And this concept of the Son God or the Trinity is not in harmony with inspiration. We will see a little closer how the issue of the mark of the beast and the contest of worship are all related as we come to the culminating and final part of this series which deals with the third angel's message. We know about the mark of the beast because it's mentioned a number of times in the book of Revelation. For example, we read about it in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 16. It says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. This mark has been an issue of question and speculation by many people over a long period of time. Many people are asking, what is the mark of the beast? What is the sign of allegiance and loyalty to the false god of Babylon? This is really what the mark of the beast means. It's a sign of allegiance. But what is the mark itself? Some people have speculated that it might have to do with technology, referring to things as microchips or barcodes. But the Bible does not tell us that. Some people think it has to do with economics, or with politics, or with any of these issues. But we must remember, the mark of the beast has to deal with the issue of worship. This is what the issue is all about. It's an issue that relates to our worship, and so the mark of the beast has to have a direct bearing on worship. Now it's interesting because we found already the identity of the first beast, also known as the great whore, and Babylon the great, the mother of harlots. And we saw that the identity of this beast was none other than the papacy. A truth that has been understood for hundreds and hundreds of years by Bible-believing Protestants. This truth indicates to us that this system will be used by the enemy to deceive people. It is so sad that there are so many people in that system who don't know these truths. Not only that, but the daughters of this system who have adopted its principles and its God are also in a great deception. They have become systems that have copied what the beast has done. In all this work of worship that goes to this 
false god, there's an important element that we need to understand that helps us realize the connection between the issue of worship, the god that is worshipped, and the mark of the beast. You see, all these people who worship the sun god would indicate their loyalty and their allegiance to the sun god by not only worshipping the sun god, but also by denoting and making a special day for the sun god. For example, we look at this question and we find the answer in history. What was the special day of the sun god? And the answer is recorded in history. It says, Sunday was already a day exalted among the heathen, being a day on which they worshipped the sun. You see, Sun worshippers would worship the sun on a special day that was commemorative and celebrating the supremacy of the sun god. This day was known as the day of the sun or sun day. We actually still retain the name of the day that indicates to whom it is dedicated. Sunday was a day dedicated to the sun god and it was the mark of allegiance and loyalty that sun worshippers would signify by their action and by worshipping on this day that this is the God they worshipped. It was an identifying mark of who they worshipped. This is a significant point because this will help us understand the mark of the beast. We already saw which God is worshipped in the system of the beast. We saw that it is the sun God. We saw that it is the God that comes all the way from Babylon. The question is now, does the beast, does the Roman power indicate to us what the mark of allegiance to this God really is? And the answer is yes. We can read it together from their own publications. It says, of course the Catholic Church claims that the change from Saturday Sabbath to Sunday was her act. And the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical authority in religious things. This was, of course, from H.F. Uh, Thomas, Chancellor of Cardinal Gibbons. You see, this statement reveals to us that Rome recognizes as a mark of her supreme authority the fact that they do not worship God on his biblical proposed day, which is the Sabbath or Saturday, but that they worship their God on the Sunday. Let's read another quote that really spells it out and brings it home for us. Notice this, quote, Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Isn't that interesting? The church is above the Bible? Is that what you believe? The Bible says that the highest authority is in God's Word. You see, any church can only derive its authority from God's Word. And it only has any authority so long as it is in harmony with God's Word. Because authority is found in the Word of God. But here we see a declaration and a confession that the Roman system tells us that Sunday is their mark of authority. This is the proof that they have authority higher than the scriptures, evidenced by the fact that they don't recognize the biblical instruction to worship the true God on his true day, but rather they worship the sun God on the Sunday. You see, friends, the Sunday is an issue that will help us understand the mark of the beast because that's an issue that relates directly to worship. The God that is worshipped in Rome is the sun God. The Bible says that. The Bible said that they worship the dragon. And we saw that the sign of allegiance to the sun God in ancient history was the Sunday. Let's see what Rome says about the worship of the sun God, commonly known as the Trinity today, and what the reason is that they worship the sun God on the Sunday. Let's read the following quote. Catholic reasons for keeping Sunday. Answer, because it is a day dedicated by the apostles to the honor of the most holy trinity. The reason why Sunday is kept is because the sun god is the one who is worshipped in Rome. Remember what Rome said, the mystery of the trinity is the central pillar 
of faith. This is the God that is worshipped. And the reason why they worship this God on Sunday is because it is the Son God. You see, friends, this is important to understand. And the issue of the mark of the beast, which will occur when a law enforces this type of false worship by a law that enforces allegiance to the sun god by worshiping on the Sunday, this is what the mark of the beast has to deal with because it directly deals with the issue of worship. You see, the Bible prophesied to us that this system, this papal power, this little horn power would think to change times and laws. We read about that in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. And he, that's the little horn, shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. This system would think to change God's law. It would think to change the time that God specified in His law for worshipping Him. We know this time is specified in the law of the Ten Commandments particularly in the fourth commandment, which specifies that the true God, the creator of heaven and earth, the one that we read about in the first angel's message, that he is to be worshipped on a particular day as a sign and as a mark of allegiance to him, commemorating and recognizing that he is the creator. This day is known as the seventh day Sabbath. We know it today as Saturday. In contrast and in opposition to that, Satan has set up a counterfeit system by mixing truth with error and causing confusion over the identity of God and creating a false concept symbolized by sun worship and all these different items that we already saw. And he claims that those who worship him are to commemorate a special day in honor of the sun god called the Sunday. You see, friends, this is the issue. This is the contest of worship in the last days. And very soon, as we saw already in Babylon, this issue will culminate in laws that will enforce obedience even to the point of death. And we will see how close we really are to that. Let's notice how Rome is realizing that the truth that has been perverted, that she promotes, the false concept of God that is in her ranks, has permeated so many Christians. Notice what we're told in the following quote from the Catholic Encyclopedia, the article entitled The Trinity. It says, The dogma of the Trinity. The Trinity is the central doctrine of the Christian religion. You see, we read earlier that Rome said this was the central doctrine of the Catholic faith. Now Rome is confident enough that this false concept of God has infiltrated so many churches that they can confidently say that it is the central doctrine of the Christian religion. Friends, the Christian religion is based on God's Word and what God's Word reveals. It's not based on what comes from Babylon. It's not based on tradition. It's not based on the satanic deceptions that combine truth with error and so confuse people. Yet so sad is this, that the whole world and all the churches are uniting together for the purpose of worshipping this God. And the Bible prophesied that this would take place, that the whole world would wander after the beast and that the whole world would worship the dragon. And we have seen what is the mask behind which the dragon is hiding. Now we are seeing how we are so close to the end in that these things are already in place. Most people, most systems, and the people in those systems are sadly unaware. Most systems are already uniting together to accomplish this. Let's notice this very interesting aspect. As it's brought out in a, uh, a body, it's brought out in an institution called the World Council of Churches. The World Council of Churches is simply a club for all the churches to join together in. This is just a simple way to portray this organization that is formed of all these different churches. You see, a church can join the World Council of Churches only if they agree with the requirements and qualify to join. The World Council of Churches, also known as the ecumenical movement, is the union of everybody together. 
But the Bible warns us that this union will not be for the purpose of worshipping the true God. Rather, it's a union that is a result of the deception that Satan is exercising through the false system of the great, ho <coughs> of the great whore. This World Council of Churches reveals to us how central the issue of worship and who is worshipped is in it. Let's read together from their own website some of the uh, qualifications where each church has to agree to before they can join this World Council of Churches. The basis of the World Council of Churches. It says, according to the World Council of Churches Constitution, agreement with the basis upon which the Council is founded is a precondition for membership. A later study by the Central Committee concluded that there was no need to change the basis, though it was necessary to explain its meaning and also make clear that the Trinity was implicit in it. Isn't that amazing? In order for you as a church to join the World Council of Churches, you must be worshipping the same God, that is the Trinity. We saw where this concept comes from. And we saw this concept portrayed in images, in pictures, and also in people's minds with regards to who God is like, what God is like. Brothers and sisters, the Bible revelation of God is not what comes from Babylon. We saw what the truth about that is. We need to understand how the system of Rome is pushing the sign and mark of allegiance to this God. And this is what will turn into the mark of the beast when it is enforced by law just as it was in Babylon when King Nebuchadnezzar enforced a law that everybody should worship the image of the idol that he created. We see in the news articles, for example, the one just before us, where Pope Benedict on Sunday speaks, and in 2005 he said, without Sunday we cannot live. We saw earlier that the Pope, as soon as he was elected, made a promise that he would unite all the factions together. He would seek to bring unity to everyone. And this unity is based, and its purpose is to come together to worship the same God. And that's why in promoting the God, this is done by promoting the day of that God. The mark of allegiance and loyalty to that God. That is the Sunday. Let's look at a few more news reports that reveal to us where we are in the timeline of history with regards to this issue of worship. And notice how the headlines deal with the issue of worship right before our eyes in fulfillment of prophecy. For example, the Pope says, Sunday worship is a necessity for all. This was in September of 2007. Let's look at another one. This is another one from the Pope. The EU must keep Sunday, says the Catholic Church. November 2008. Isn't that interesting? Why is the Pope requiring Sunday and bringing attention to Sunday in Europe and in other parts of the world? Because this is the mark and sign of allegiance to the Sun God. You see, keep in mind, Satan is operating through the systems of this world to bring them to worship him. This is done by exalting the day of the Sun and putting down and aside the day of the true God. Because this union and this worship is not going to the true God. It's going to the Sun God. Let's read on how Europe responds to the requests of the Pope. For example, here we have uh, the, this news article, Sunday Shopping Banned in Croatia. And this was in July of 2008. You see, the Croatian Parliament passed a law that bans shopping on Sunday. Why is that? In response to the request of the Pope. Remember what the Bible said? That this great Babylon rules or reigns over the kings of the earth. The kings of the earth give ear and follow the instruction that they receive from this system. That's why Satan is using this system to bring about and put in place laws that deal with the issue of worship to promote his agenda in opposition to God's law. Let's look at a few more. For example, Germany reaffirms Sunday law this was in December of 2009. 
This is getting closer. Other countries are recognizing and heeding the call of the Pope. Let's look at another situation. How we see the system of Rome has worldwide influence over the kings of the earth. In other words, what the Pope requests and desires many times is put in place or movements and actions are taken to put it in place to heed his wishes. This is how Satan is using this system to reign and rule over the kings of the earth. Notice, for example, the following news article. The Pope calls for a global authority on economy. Remember the economy crisis that happened not too long ago? This economy crisis, a lot of people understand, was manufactured to bring about certain situations. I will not go into the details of this. I'm not an economist myself. But we see that trouble and disasters in the world bring the attention of the world to an authority that asks and demands for certain things. For example, in the Sydney Morning Herald, this is what it had to say about this particular aspect. Let's read it. The Pope calls for a new world order. It says, His suggested political authority would manage globalization, revive economies, stop the crisis deepening, protect the environment, and regulate worldwide migration. It would need to be universally recognized and given power to ensure compliance from all countries. You see, friends, the Pope, he has a strong influence over the world. They want to put together a new world order where this global authority would ensure compliance from all countries. In other words, it would be a system where laws would be established that would rule and reign over all the countries. And the very thing that Rome wants to promote is allegiance and loyalty to their God. This is why in the very near future we will see movements and action put in place to heed the counsel and request of the Pope to enforce laws that will promote Sunday as a day of worship in allegiance to the false god of the sun. You see, friends, this is what the Bible means when it talks about the mark of the beast. It's the enforcement of an issue of worship by a civil and legal law that is in direct opposition to the truth of God. That is why God sends the last call of mercy to the world, the three angels' messages, to alert them and to wake them up before it's too late so that people will not be deceived. This is why we have this series, so that you might not be deceived by the deceptions and errors of Satan. We need to know who we worship, and we need to also know when we worship. We also need to know how we worship. These are vital issues in the contest that is happening right now in the world. Revelation 14, 7 tells us to fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and to worship Him that made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. This description of God as the creator of all things, we saw, identifies the Father, the great source of all, the one of whom are all things, according to 1 Corinthians 8, 6. God, as the creator of all things, has a sign and a mark of allegiance that distinguishes Him from false gods. When the angel was saying those words, he was essentially quoting from the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments. He was quoting the commandment which speaks about God as the creator of heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Because in that commandment, God specifies the mark or sign of allegiance to Him. It's also known in the scriptures as the seal of the living God. Let's go to Exodus chapter 20 and see how God describes this. Verse 11 says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Because God is the creator and the source of all things, He has given us instruction as His creatures to recognize Him as the true God, to recognize Him as the creator in keeping and remembering the seventh day, the Sabbath, to keep it holy. 
if we look at the elements that make up a legal seal, we will find that the Sabbath commandment has all the elements that makes it the seal of the truth of who God really is. This is why the issue between the mark of the beast and the seal of God is over the issue of worship. Let's read and see what the elements of a legal seal have. For example, God's seal contains his name, his title, and his territory. We know that any seal issued by any authority or government contains these three elements. It is in the same way with God's own seal. For example, God's name is identified in the fourth commandment as the Lord or Yahweh. His title is the maker or the creator. And his territory is said to be heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. You see, friends, this is the mark and sign of allegiance to the true God. A lot of people understand this truth. They understand that the issue and the contest of worship in the last days will be played out over which day you will keep. But we need to understand that the issue is not just which day. The day actually signifies which God you are worshiping. You know what, friends? You could be keeping the right day, but worshiping the wrong God. If you remember the Jews in Israel, when they rejected Jesus, they were keeping the right day. But they had rejected the Lord of the Sabbath. We need to keep in mind that the issue of which day we worship does not so supersede which God is worshipped. Just as the Lord of the Sabbath is so infinitely greater than the Sabbath, so also we need to recognize that the days are signifying the God. That's who the issue and that's who the contest is all about. This is what the war is all about in the last days. Which God will you worship? And this will be played out in the days that are dedicated to the God of the Bible or the God of this world. God recognizes and tells us that the seventh day Sabbath is the sign of allegiance to Him. We read about that in Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12. It says, Moreover also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they may know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. This is the sign of allegiance that God gives that will identify his people as worshiping him. But we must keep in mind that Satan will try and deceive people so that even though they keep the right day, they could be worshiping the wrong God. We must have the right day, but more importantly, we must have the right God. That's what the first angel's message reveals. Who is this God that we are to worship? And we found out that this is none other than the Father. When we come to the third angel's message, the issues become very, very crystallized. Let's read it together and see. Because if God is telling us that the issue is over worship, He gives us enough information to know what we should and shouldn't do. Let's read Revelation 14 and verses 9 and 10. It says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Continuing, verse 11, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. We see clearly here that the issue of worship is again repeated in the third angel's message with one of the strongest warnings ever found in the scriptures. To drink of the wine of the wrath of God without mixture, without being mingled with mercy. This is a warning that God gives so that none need to be deceived. And the issue is worship. Those who worship the beast and his image and those who receive his mark are in very very dangerous situation. We need to understand clearly who we are to worship and who we are not to worship. And in light of the enormity of this issue of worship, the Bible has made it clear to us 
who we give our worship to. In this section, we will just look briefly at the examples in the scripture where we are given instruction as to who we worship, and we also look at examples of that instruction being carried out. And this will help us and ensure that we are not deceived by the enemy in the last days over the issue of who we worship. Let's look at a few Bible examples. We'll begin with the story of Jesus that we referred to earlier. In John chapter 4, verses 21 and 22, the Bible tells us, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. This is an interesting dialogue that Jesus had with the woman at the well. In this part, we are looking at the instruction from the highest authority as to who we can safely worship, knowing that we are not deceived. Here Jesus makes clear that the true worshipers are going to worship the Father. And he also makes a very important point. He says to the woman at the well, Ye know not what ye worship. Jesus here was not commending her for not knowing who they worship. You see, God wants us to know that we are worshiping Him. He wants us to know Him aright. He wants us to know Him as He has revealed Himself to us. This is what worship is all about. It's intelligent worship, signified in the book of Revelation by the fact that the true worshipers have the Father's name written in their foreheads. They have a correct understanding. They know who they worship. Unlike those who do not have the Father's name in their foreheads, those who receive the mark of the beast in their foreheads or in their hands, they do not have a correct understanding of God. They are worshiping a mystery. They are worshiping a concept that does not come from the Scriptures. Verse 23, Jesus continues and says, but the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Here we see plain instruction that we are commanded to worship the Father. This is who the true worshippers will worship, according to the first angel's message. Not only that, but we see this instruction being carried out by some people, examples of which we will see in the scriptures. Let's look at Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3. Paul here says, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. What beautiful, simple harmony we find in the Scriptures. We have instruction as to who we worship and we have examples of that instruction being carried out. This is done so that God can safeguard us from the deceptions of Satan in the last days. And in this part we are seeing who we can safe, safely worship. We see clearly that the Father is such. Let's look at another example. Philippians, sorry, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, instruction being carried out by the Apostle Paul, worshiping the Father. It is safe for us to do that. But God gives us even clearer revelations in the scripture. He reveals to us things that not only happen on earth, but things that happen and take place in heaven, so that we can be 100% confident and sure of what we are to do when it comes to the issue of worship. Let's see how the beings in heaven relate to the issue of worship. Who do they worship in heaven? We read about that in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 14. It says, And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. You see, friends, the beings in heaven worship him that liveth forever and ever. That's the Father. God's instruction is so that we can have harmony in our worship in heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. After all, this is what we pray in the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And it is God's will that we worship Him intelligently and correctly, knowing who He is, just like the beings in heaven, intelligently and correctly worship God, knowing who He is. But the issue of worship does not stop there. Are we given instruction 
as to worship when it comes to Christ Jesus our Lord? Let's have a look at what the Bible has to say. In John chapter 5, verse 23, we read the following. That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. Here we see instruction that we are to honor the Son of God in exactly the same way and to the exact same degree that we honor the Father. This extends to our worship. Not only is it safe for us to worship the Father, seeing examples of this on earth and in heaven, but we are to do the same for Christ Jesus. And the wonderful thing about the scriptures is it now gives us examples of people carrying out this instruction. You see, God doesn't want us to be confused at all when it comes to worship. Let's read one such example found in the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verses 35 to 38. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. What a beautiful story of the man that was healed from his blindness, that was cast out of the synagogue because he confessed that Jesus was a real prophet of God, a man through whom God was working. Jesus went and found him. And of all the questions that Jesus could ask him, he asks him this important question. Do you believe on the Son of God? We saw why this question is important. Because everything hinges on who Christ really is, being the only begotten Son of God. And when the man recognized that it was Christ speaking to him, the one who healed him, the Bible says that the man worshipped him. So here we see clear instruction that it is safe for us and necessary to follow God's instruction to worship Christ, to recognize him as the Son. Remember, we need to honor him as the Son, knowing his divine inheritance. Let's look at a few other examples. Matthew 14, 31 and 33. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. Isn't that a beautiful description? Here we see that worship that goes to the Lord Jesus Christ is intimately linked with the identity of Him being the Son of God. This is the key to understanding that our worship that goes to Christ Jesus is because He is the Son of God. In honoring the Son, we actually honor the Father. We saw instruction given to us to honor the Son. We saw examples of this instruction being carried out on earth. But what about heavenly beings? Do we have examples of that too? Well, the answer is yes. God has given us every evidence in order to hang our faith on so that we be not deceived by the enemy. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 6. The Bible says, And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. Friends, even the angels of heaven are instructed to worship Christ. And they follow that instruction. The Bible says that the angels delight to obey and follow the commands of God. Angels, heavenly beings, are commanded to worship Christ because of who He is. Here we see again the link in the fact that He is the first begotten, the only begotten of God, who is worshipped and recognized in that he has a divine inheritance, an inheritance that makes him everything that the Father is in possessing the divine nature, and therefore worthy of our worship and our adoration. You see, this is why Jesus is the only one who can say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Nobody else can fill that position. So here we see this instruction of worship given and examples of it being carried out. I want to deal with an issue here that may arise in people's minds. And that is, does that mean that we worship two different gods? The answer is no. And the Bible will reveal to us how our worship 
ultimately is given to the true and living God, the maker of heaven and earth. You see, all the worship that we are giving and honor and praise and recognition of Christ ultimately goes to his Father because he is the way to the Father. That's actually the only way that we can worship the Father aright is through his Son. The Bible makes that clear in Philippians chapter 2 verses 10 and 11. It says that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, when we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, when we bow to Him and worship Him and give glory and honor to Him, this is the ultimate honor and glory that we can give to the Father. All the glory that Christ receives ultimately goes to the Father. The Bible says, to the glory of God the Father. He is the one who is worshipped in heaven and earth. This is only possible through His Son. You know, friends, the Bible stops right there when it comes to the issue of worship. There is no one else besides the Father and the Son that we are commanded to worship. Nor do we find any examples of anyone worshiping truly and correctly anyone besides the Father and the Son. We find many examples of people worshiping false gods and false idols, an instruction that the Bible does not give us. The only instruction we have is that we are to recognize the Father as the only true and living God and we're to recognize His Son and worship Him in the same way, recognizing Him as the divine inheritor of the very nature of God. But there is in the Bible somebody else who wants worship, somebody that we should not worship. We know that from the temptation of Christ in the wilderness when the devil came to Him seeking that very thing. Matthew 4, 8 and 9 records the story. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. This is the desire of Satan, to receive worship. That's why God has given us plain instruction as to who we can safely and correctly worship. Satan has been seeking worship from the beginning. And this issue will climax in the end in the contest of worship. And Satan will use and is using a very clever deception to receive worship. Notice the answer of Jesus. Verse 10, Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Jesus makes it clear that worship ultimately belongs to only one being in the universe. That is the true and living God. Friends, this is what the first angel's message is all about. People in the world have lost this knowledge. That's why God sends a message that says, Fear God, give glory to Him and worship Him. Because the hour of His judgment is come. It's important to keep in mind that any worship, that goes outside the Father and the Son will be claimed by the being who desires worship, that is Lucifer. This is a vital point that a lot of people don't recognize. God gave this instruction clearly in the Bible so that our worship would be to the Father through the Son and no one else. And we saw clearly how Rome, because of the false concept of Babylon that she inherited from Babylon, worships outside the Father and the Son. Through a false understanding of the Spirit of God, Satan has weaved a deception to steal worship from those who want to truly serve God. Let's see how else the Scriptures expand on this point. We want to make sure that we are on the right track because we are dealing with a sensitive issue. We're dealing with a salvational issue, a critical issue, the issue that will be the contest in the last days, the issue of worship. In John chapter 14 and verse 1, Jesus comforts His disciples by saying, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in Me. How many must we believe in in order to have our hearts comforted and not troubled? Two, the Father and the Son. The only two that we are called upon to worship. 
the only two who are divine in their nature and essence. The Father, the only true God, and His only begotten Son, and no one else. This is not the only place where we read about that. Let's look at John chapter 17 and verse 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. Friends, our eternal life is dependent on knowing and having a relationship with how many beings? Two, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom He has sent. Why is that? Because they're the only divine beings in existence. They're the only ones we're called upon to worship. Because the Father, the only true God, had an only begotten Son who inherited from Him His divine nature. And that is what qualifies Him to be a recipient of our worship and a mediator for our communication between us and God. Many people, in talking about the Father and the Son, do not realize the distinction that the Father and the Son are actually two individual beings. The Bible told us earlier in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6 that God has a form and His Son is in the same form. That's two beings, each with a form, and Christ is in the form of His Father. We saw that's true because God operates on a physical and visible level. We also saw that He operates on the spiritual level. But let's see how Jesus clarified for us the reality that He and the Father are actual individual beings. And this is the reality of the God that we worship. We read about it in John chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. Jesus says, It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. According to Jesus, He and the Father are two. Two individual beings. Two beings who together have created all things as we have seen. Two beings that the first angel's message calls attention to the world to recognize the true God through His Son. And these two beings are being attacked by false concepts of Satan. The Antichrist system, the Bible says, denies the Father and the Son. It denies that and it adds to that a false concept, giving it Christian names and titles in order for Satan to steal worship that belongs to God. This is how vital this issue is. And I pray that you will seek God most earnestly, that you might understand and be safe in the last days. Because the last days are not something that will come upon us. We're already living in the last days. In the Bible, further clarifications and confirmations are given to show us that the divine nature of God, in that He is the only true God and His Son, Jesus Christ, that they too and no one else are responsible for our salvation. We read about this in the book of Zechariah in the Old Testament, chapter 6 and verses 12 and 13. It says, And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. This is a prophecy about Christ, referred to in this verse as the branch. And the Bible tells us that He will build the temple of the Lord. He will bear the glory. He will accomplish our salvation, the plan of salvation that was designed to bring and restore peace to us. The Bible calls it the council of peace. Friends, the Bible is clear. This council of peace was formulated between two beings. The Bible says the council of peace shall be between them both. It was the Father and the Son who together in council, before the creation of all things, planned and put in place a delivery and rescue plan should we fall into sin. And when we fell into sin, Jesus came and indeed bore the glory and built the temple of the Lord. And right now He is our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary ministering in the Father's presence, in the holiest of all. Friends, this is the truth of the Scriptures. 
And those who are saved will recognize that the plan of salvation, all the credit, all the glory and honor is given in the plan of salvation to those two beings who formulated the plan and who accomplished the plan. We read about this in Revelation chapter 7. Notice what it says, verse uh, 9 and 10. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. You see, the beings who will be saved, those who are redeemed from the earth, recognize that salvation belongs to God and the Lamb. The only two beings who formulated and accomplished the plan of salvation. That's why they are the only two beings that we are called upon to worship, recognizing that one is the Father, the only true God, the great source of all, and that Christ, His Son, inherited from His Father all things, including His divine nature. He is the only way to the Father. This is recognized not only by those who are redeemed from earth, but by all the heavenly intelligences and beings in this wonderful scene of worship that we read about in Revelation chapter 5, verse 13 and 14. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb for ever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. This wonderful scene of worship is directed to him that sitteth upon the throne, that's the Father, and to the Lamb for ever and ever. And then the creatures in heaven say, Amen. Something that we say at the end of prayer without recognizing or acknowledging anyone else in this circle of worship. You see, friends, the creatures in heaven know and understand that only the Father and the Son are to be worshipped. And God wants His people on earth to be in harmony in their worship with the beings that are in heaven. That's what we pray in the Lord's Prayer. God wants His people to worship Him as if they were in heaven. Because very soon He is coming to take those who worship Him in spirit and in truth, to be in heaven, to behold His face always, and to spend eternity with Him, worshipping Him, and drawing closer and closer to Him. That's why the devil knows this, and he is seeking to keep that wonderful reward from each and every one of us, by deceiving the world over the issue of worship. That's why we must vitally know who we worship. Let's read this beautiful description in the closing verses of the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 21, verses 22 and 23. The Bible says, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Friends, this wonderful Bible truth is made abundantly clear, that in the kingdom forever and ever, we will behold and have fellowship with God who sits on the throne and with the Lamb forever and ever. You can see now how deceptive the plan of Satan is in giving a distorted view of God and His Son and their spirit to create worship that goes outside the Father and the Son for the purpose of deceiving the whole world. That is why God, in loving mercy, sends the three angels' messages the messages that we have been sharing with you through this series, that you might be aware of the deception and escape, and not only you, but that you might alert others, that they too might escape and be found among those who worship God in spirit and in truth, those who recognize the truth of who God is, who His Son is, and how they relate to them in worship. Friends, the Bible conclusion is clear. The Father and the Son alone are to be worshipped. I pray and I ask that the Lord, by His Spirit, His Holy Spirit, His presence in your heart, will bring conviction to your heart that you might be able to stand when the day comes when you will be threatened with death if you do not comply with the laws of the land 
to worship the beast and his image and to receive his mark, the sign of allegiance to the false son God in your forehead or in your hand. Only God can help you stand in that time. There is nothing that you can do outside of Jesus Christ who can only help you in that time of trouble. I pray that you will make Jesus your rock and foundation right now and come in line with the worshipers in heaven to worship God aright as He desires us to worship Him. I will pray now in closing and ask that the Lord will seal His truth in the heart of you if this is your choice. Would you join me? Our loving Father in heaven, in Jesus' name we pray and come before Thee with thanksgiving for revealing to us in Thy Word the wonderful truths and how the plan of the enemy is so deceptive. We thank Thee for granting us Thy Spirit as we have studied these deep things. And I pray and I ask, Father, that each and every listener will receive a rich portion of Thy Spirit to lead them and to guide them into all truth. That we might be all, Lord, be found faithful in worshipping Thee in spirit and in truth, faithful to the end, that we might be united with those in heaven who worship Thee in spirit and in truth. We thank Thee for the three angels' messages. Help us, Lord, to understand the import of these messages that we might be able to give them to the world around us. We thank Thee and we praise Thee in the precious and worthy name of our dear Savior and coming King, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>